Hello everyone, today I'm going to be attempting to give you a full course in candle magic. What is candle magic? Candle magic is a type of sympathetic magic often found in witchcraft practices, though there are many types of spirituality that incorporate a little bit of candle magic. You'll see this in a lot of religious traditions or folk magic. You may even see this in more new age spirituality circles. Candle magic is definitely something that is practiced by many, many people in many different traditions. Also, as a side note, as I'm filming this, the sun is like peeking in and out of the clouds right now. So you're probably gonna see a little bit of sun reflection throughout this video. I apologize for the lighting, just bear with me. So candle magic is a type of sympathetic magic. What does sympathetic magic mean? It is basically this idea that like attracts like. You have physical correspondences that represent your desires, your intentions, and that helps to take your internal desires out into the physical world for manifestation. So you are setting a stage with physical correspondences that align to whatever it is that you personally internally desire. And through those physical associations, you are able to manifest the things that you want. So in candle magic, you're using the candles as the participants of your spell, of your working, of your ritual, etc. The candles can represent people, if there are specific people you're wanting to do this working around. The candles can represent specific ideas, such as love and money, protection. And by manipulating these candles, you are able to show the universe what it is that you desire. So there is a prerequisite for this video. I would recommend knowing how to center your energy, ground your energy and direct your energy prior to performing any sort of candle magic working. And if you are unfamiliar with those concepts, I do have a video on this. I will link it down below in the description box. I did film it a while ago and I tend to talk very fast. I think in that particular video, I was talking really fast because that's just my natural speed of speech. So there's an option on YouTube where you can go in and you can slow down the speech by 0.75. And I think that's the option that helps people quite a bit when listening to some of my videos. You guys, I try to talk slow. I try so hard, but I am a fast talker and I'm working on it. So you're going to need to know how to center, ground, and direct your energy because this is energy work. Candle magic does involve energy work. If you take a candle and you light it and you sit it in front of you and then you do no energy work whatsoever, chances are that it is not going to manifest anything for you. <laughs> Maybe something random will magically happen for you, but most likely if you're not doing any energy work behind it, you're not going to have your desire manifest in the way that you want them to manifest. So the energy work that goes behind candle magic is very, very important and you definitely need to know how to work with your own energy. So I'd like to paint a picture for you of a very, very simple candle working because this can be as simple or as complicated as you want it to be. And this video is really going to bounce around from beginner to intermediate to advanced topics, kind of all rolled into one candle magic course. I'm hoping that even intermediate practitioners watching this video will come away from this video with at least one new idea or one new spark of inspiration that they haven't heard of previously. So I'm gonna kind of sprinkle in a lot of different things into this video. But painting a picture of a very simple candle ritual, let's say you get a white candle and on that white candle you carve in a singular word, just one word that pertains to whatever intention it is that you are wanting to bring forth in the physical world. So let's say that word is love or let's say it is money, etc. Maybe you want to be a little bit more specific with your intention statement, but you know, we'll get to that later in the video. So you have your white candle, you're carving your intention word into that candle and then you light the candle in front of you and you begin to do some energy work. So you start by centering your energy, grounding your energy, and then directing your energy into the candle, carrying your intention. And at this point, you are imagining what it's going to be like when that spell manifests. So you are going to visualize your intention as if it is something that's already happened. So if you want a new job, there's a particular job that you're doing a candle magic spell for, you would visualize yourself already working at that job as if they had already hired you and as if you were already working there. You are going to visualize what it feels like. You're gonna visualize what it looks 
looks like. Maybe visualizing some of your coworkers around you, really filling yourself up with the excitement of having that job. And then after some time of visualizing your intention coming true, you would just let the candle burn down to completion, and there you have it. That is a very, very simple candle magic spell, and you really don't have to do anything more than that. However, if you want to spice it up, if you want to get a lot more precise, you want to bring in some more intermediate concepts into your candle magic routines, that is what this video is for. So again, I just want to start this video by saying that it doesn't have to be complicated. You can literally sit down with a white candle in front of you, do some visualizations, and let the candle burn down, and boom, you're done. That's all you have to do. But again, if you want to get a little bit more spicy and creative, we're going to talk about a bunch of different tips and techniques in this video. For me, candle magic starts really with the timing of your spell. Now this is a personal opinion, not everybody does this of course. If you need to do a spell right now, then you do that spell right now. There are times where it's an emergency, I need to do a ritual right now because I need to interfere with something that is a very, very time sensitive manner. So I definitely want to preface this with that, that if you need to do a spell, then you do a spell anytime that you want. However, if you do have the luxury of incorporating some timing, planetary timing or sea seasonal timing, anything like that into your spell, in my experience, it's gonna make it a lot more effective. I did already do a video on magical timing because this is a subject that deserves its own giant video. I think I, I think that video was like 30 minutes long. I went over tons of different timings in that video. So this video isn't really gonna be about that, but I think it's important to consider the day of the week, the time of the day, whether you're wanting to go into a liminal space or not, such as dawn and dusk. You can even factor in the season that you're in. You can factor in some other astrological correspondences. If there's a particular planet you're wanting to work with or a zodiac sign, let's say the sun is in Scorpio, which it is today at the time of filming this, that energy of the sun being in Scorpio is going to lend a certain flavor to the spell work if I want it to. So I definitely encourage you getting into planetary days and planetary hours at the minimum. Again, not everybody does this, but I have noticed a drastically increased amount of success when I started incorporating planetary timing into my spell work. So I can say myself, yes, it does matter. Yes, it does make a difference. Again, if you want more information about that, go check out that other video I did about magical timings, and it goes over all of that in great depth. But I had to put a note of that here in this video just to at least properly set the stage that you wanna be considering the timing of your spell and making sure all of the energies of the universe are kind of in alignment with what you're trying to go for. The next step for a candle magic ritual is you want to prepare yourself and prepare your space. So this can look a lot of different ways. You know, some people really value a sort of purification process prior to ritual. Uh, some people don't care. So it's going to be up to you. When it comes to preparing your space, you might want to consider cleansing your space. You can do this with a very simple smoke cleanse. So you can light up some incense or light up some herbs, get a smoke stick, whatever it is, and then walk around your room, just kind of smoke cleanse the space and you can even use herbs that correspond to the actual intention of your spell if you really want to prepare the room for a specific environment for this spell to take place but you really just want to think about wiping away the old <laughs> clearing out any old stagnant energies because you don't want any of that flowing into your candle magic working the burning of incense or aromatic herbs or resins is a practice of great antiquity there is an ancient belief in some cultures that the smoke from incense can carries the practitioner's prayers up to God. Now, of course, you don't have to believe in God, but the idea is nice to ponder about, right? Having the incense carry your prayers, your thoughts, your manifestations up into the cosmos to whatever sort of higher power you believe in. Although again, you don't have to, this is coming from a former atheist, so you can believe in whatever you want. If you don't particularly like smoke, if you have pets that are maybe sensitive to that smoke, because yes, you definitely wanna be cautious what you're burning if you have dogs and cats, just to make sure it's not toxic for them. You can use bells or chimes or sound. Sound is a great way to energetically clear the space. So if you have one of those old bells that you thrifted from the thrift store, feel free to go around the room and ring it. A lot of different traditions will have a lot of different ceremonies around sound. So they will ring a bell, a specific 
specific number of times to symbolize a particular energy that they are either wanting to get rid of or an energy that they're wanting to bring into their space. You can play some binaural beats that end up bringing in a certain type of energy, whatever you want to do. The topic of sound is so vast. Some people really like to use shamanic drumming as well, although I think that's more to get you into an altered state of consciousness and more of a trance state rather than like cleansing out and clearing your space. But again, get creative. You're really just clearing out that old stagnant energy. And as you prepare your space, you're also going to want to consider preparing yourself for the ritual. This really depends if you're a little bit more of a ceremonial practitioner or a folk practitioner, what style you may end up going with. Some people, especially people that are a little bit more into ceremonial magic, really value this idea of purifying yourself prior to doing any sort of working or ritual or spell, whatever it is. Some folk practitioners may disagree with that and say, hell no, I don't care about purifying myself. I will say I've done candle magic rituals both ways. And if I am taking the time to prepare myself beforehand and to purify myself, and we'll, we'll talk about purification in a second, I do find that it is a lot easier for me to bring my energy into the ritual to be very precise. And I do typically see a better outcome when I am preparing my space and preparing myself before the ritual even begins than when I don't. However, there are certain times where, again, going back to that scenario of it's an emergency, I need to do a candle ritual right now. I don't have time to prepare my space or to energetically cleanse myself and purify myself, etc. And those spells can still be just as powerful. So again, personal preference, it's just something that you might want to consider beforehand. One of my favorite ways to purify, and really I don't particularly care for the term purify, that is a whole rant that I will not discuss in this video because it's not like we're trying to purify ourselves. I don't know, the word purity has a lot of connotations with it that I don't particularly care for, but I digress. Some of the ways to cleanse yourself and to get yourself energetically in the state to perform this candle magic ritual are the following. You can take a ritual bath. This is something that is very popular among many different magicians and witches and practitioners of all types. So a ritual bath is not the same as a regular bath. You know, a regular bath, you're climbing in the bath and you are scrubbing down your body trying to get clean. You're cleaning off all the physical dirt. That is something that you already want to have done prior to this whole purification process. You want to come in, you know, physically clean. A ritual bath is more like a spiritual and energetic bath. So if you are getting into the bathtub, you are soaking in a mixture of herbs. Maybe you've got crystals around you that pertain to the type of energy that you're wanting to embody. You can throw in some rosemary into the bath, some eucalyptus, some rose petals, some plants. Plantain. I mean, do your research on your herbal allies and really choose herbs that correspond to either purifying yourself and cleansing yourself or that correspond to the intention of your spell so that you can get in the right state of mind. And while you're in the bath, you're allowing the energetic properties of all of those herbs and the crystals around you and other correspondences to seep into your body. So what I like to do is I visualize everything seeping into the core of my being, breaking up any energetic blockages that may be in my body. Body. And then when I get out of the bath and rinse the bathtub, I turn on the shower and I do a quick little rinse off, you know, because there's herb pieces stuck on me and I want to rinse off. But I visualize all the energetic gunk and all the blockages that were in my body previously draining down the drain, going down my body and down into the drain. And then when I step out of the shower after my ritual bath, I feel energetically clean. I don't feel like I have any blockages in my body anymore. And I could really focus my intention and my energy where it needs to go for this candle magic ritual. If you don't particularly care for baths or if you don't have a bathtub, you can do all of this in the shower as well. You can create a little shower steamer for yourself, put a bunch of herbs in like a pouch and then hang it over your shower head or put it like at the base of your shower and then just take a shower with the herbs doing the same sort of visualization techniques. As part of the purification process, some people like to fast beforehand. So they will do a brief period of fasting before the candle magic ritual. And it doesn't necessarily have to be fasting or abstaining from food. It can be a different type of fasting or abstination. You can abstain from technology for a period of time. If you're a smoker, you can abstain from smoking. You can abstain from alcohol, from caffeine, or even heavy carbs. But it is really this ritual sacrifice, this idea of sacrificing something or abstaining from something in order to reach a more purified state. I don't personally, this is the rant that I'm not, I'm not fully going to include this rant in this video, but I don't personally think anybody at any point can be 100% purified because 
humans are goblins, okay? <laughs> I don't think the goal is to be 100% purified in my own personal opinion here. I know I'm gonna piss off a bunch of ceremonial magicians probably with my statement, but the idea really is to become as purified as humanly possible, not to achieve this state of 100% purification. Some people like to do the lesser banishing ritual as a form of purification prior to any sort of ritual. So if you don't like to do the bath or the shower, you don't wanna do any fasting or abstaining from anything, you can do something like the lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram, the LBRP. You can do just a simple meditation, a simple meditation where you start from the crown of your head and you work your way down, meditating on each point in your body, relaxing each point, visualizing any blockages being released and opened up and letting those go, giving those back to the earth so that the earth can recycle that energy. So many different types of meditations and ways to prepare yourself prior to a ritual. Once you have gone through some sort of cleansing process, with your space and yourself, it is time to adorn yourself. Again, this is a little bit more of a ceremonial magic idea. So if you're more of a folk practitioner or an eclectic witch or something, you may not vibe with this and that's totally fine. Some people really enjoy wearing specific robes or specific jewelry in their ritual. Some people prefer to do candle magic rituals completely in the nude. I think this is a very like old school Wiccan perspective and I think there's a couple other traditions that do this as well. Some people only do it in the nude. Some people only wear purple robes. Some people only wear a snake ring on their finger. Okay, so this is something that you're gonna have to do further research on to figure out what works best for you. But I like to think of all of these ideas as psychological triggers because I'm very much into psychology. If you have a purple robe that you only wear during a candle magic ritual, every single time you wear that purple robe, it is going to become easier and easier to get into that right state of mind and to perform a ritual to direct your energy in the way that you want it to go. And you can bring in color correspondences here as well. I mean, purple is the color of spirituality, of psychic abilities, of beyond. Or if you want to wear a blue robe, blue is very much about the mind, the intellect, the mental space and intelligence. So play with your color correspondences, pick an outfit that feels good to you, or go in the nude. You know, you figure that out for yourself. I have certain types of jewelry that I put on for very specific rituals. So if I'm doing a love working, I have certain jewelry that I put on. If I'm doing a protection working, I have a certain, you know, outfit and jewelry that I put on. So I think it's really important to play with those psychological triggers and really create a system that works best for you. Next, I wanna to talk to you about sizes and shapes of different candles and what they can be used for in different types of candle magic rituals. So we're gonna talk about size and shape next, and then we'll talk about color afterwards. So for right now, ignore the color on these candles because we're gonna talk about that, but I have a bunch of candles here in front of me and we are going to go smallest to biggest. So I think the smallest candle would actually be a birthday candle. I don't have any of those in the house right now, but yes, you can use birthday candles in candle magic rituals. I just don't have one to show you here. I think considering the size is really important when putting it up next to your intention. How big is your intention? How much energy are you going to have to put into this ritual? So for example, let's say you're doing a really quick spell and you lost something. Maybe you lost your ring. That happened to me a little bit ago. I lost my engagement ring and I was freaking out and I needed to do a little spell in order to find that ring. I did actually find it, by the way. It was in a really weird place, but I digress. You Using something really small for a spell like that, like a birthday candle, a tea light candle, a tiny little votive, which we'll get into those in a second, is totally appropriate because the amount of energy that it's gonna take you to cast a very quick spell like that, a lost and found spell, it's not gonna take you really that much energy at all and really not that much time. In comparison to if you were to cast a self-love spell, let's say that this is a huge, massive theme of you continuously working on loving yourself because that's something that you struggle with or it's part of your shadow workings or whatever it is. This this is going to take a lot more energy and a lot more effort in this ritual. And it's probably something that is gonna last a really long time. I mean, to do a self-love spell, let's say you struggle with self-love your entire life. Logically speaking, if you sit down and do one little candle spell, do you think that's gonna magically fix your self-love issues? Probably not. Speaking from my own personal experience here, it's probably something that you're gonna wanna do a little bit each day for a really long period 
period of time in order to manifest the self-love that you want. And this isn't me trying to give tough love right now. This is me trying to be realistic that bigger themes in your life or bigger intentions that require more movement are going to require candles that can burn a lot longer. So like for a self-love spell, I would go for a big fat pillar candle because this is something that I want to be burning over days, weeks, months for a really, really long time. So considering size, I do think it's important because obviously the bigger the candle, the longer the burn time and the more time you have to put your energy into that spell. I can already hear a comment right now that I want to address and get this out of the way. Yes, I do believe that really powerful spells can happen with a very small candle such as a tea light or even a birthday candle. What I'm trying to say is that the size of the candle doesn't matter as much as how much energy you're actually putting into the spell because you want to make sure that the amount of energy that you're putting into this spell matches the size of your intention. I know someone somewhere is going to comment, well, I did a super powerful spell with just a tea light candle. And yes, that is absolutely possible. I'm not saying that that's not possible. What I'm getting at here is that it's important to consider how much energy is necessary to put into this spell to receive what it is that you desire. So anyway, starting with a birthday candle, you can obviously use that for quick magic. It's great in a pinch, love birthday candles. The next size up would be a little tea light candle like this. And I don't know why people don't use tea light candles more often. I think they're fabulous and so underrated. It's very, very easy to take some oil that pertains to your intention and just anoint the top of your tea light candle. You can do a little incantation as you say this, light the tea light candle and meditate as you stare into the flame. So something that I like like to do, I love to use tea lights as a concentration aid. So if I'm about to sit down and do some divination, let's say I'm going to do some scrying or I'm working with my tarot cards or maybe I have some oracle cards that I want to do, whatever. Or even if I'm talking to a spirit or a deity, whatever. I want to do some divination and I want some sort of concentration aid. Tea lights are great for this. What you do is you just anoint the tea light with some sort of divination oil, prophecy oil, an oil that has been made for enhancing psychic abilities or psychic sight or something like that. You can make your own oils. We're going to talk about oils later in this video, so we'll get to that. But I light the tea light up, I set it on my desk, and then I just focus into the flame. I stare into the flame as I meditate, allow myself to go into an altered state of consciousness, and I let that oil and the tea light do its thing. And I let that light guide me as I pull my tarot cards or my oracle cards or whatever it is that I'm doing. So tea light candles are great. They're also great for quick magic, just like birthday candles. So if you've got a quick spell that you want to do, these are great for on the go. You can take them in a little travel altar as well. So if you're not at home and you want to do some magic wherever you are, bring a tea light candle with you. And that's really all you need to do a really effective candle magic ritual. So then we move up in size and we've got votive candles. These are candles that are not surrounded by a shell. So as you can see with this tea light candle, it's surrounded by a shell. So you don't really need a candle holder for this. You can burn it just as is. With votive candles, you do need a candle holder because there's nothing around the outside of it. So you're going to want some sort of candle holder for this. And I love these for small to medium spells. Again, this is just my own personal opinion. So you're going to have to play around with a bunch of these different shapes and see what works best for you in your magical practice. I have found with these, it burns for a couple hours and it's the perfect length of time to do a more small medium type working. So with these, these are excellent because you can actually start to carve things into them. We'll also talk about that later in the video, but you can carve your sigils into this candle, your intention phrases, your tag locks, all of those things. You can anoint it with herbs and oils, and it's just the perfect size for a medium spell. Other types of candles that I really love for small, medium-sized spells are these chime candles. So you can get these in packs, you can get them in all different colors, but they are the perfect size to anoint with some oil, to add your tag lock, your herbs around it, your crystals, your whatever. And these are meant to burn down in one sitting. You would sit there and do your energy work and you would let this burn down to completion. So I usually buy these in packs. For example, here is a pack of black and you can get these at any 
metaphysical store. I'm sure Amazon has them as well, but honestly, but I think they might be a little overpriced. So you'll have to shop around, check the metaphysical shops in your area to see if they have little packs of chime candles because these are so great. I have a bunch of different colors on hand at all times. These are probably the candles that I have the most of because they're so versatile and I can just grab them, do my spell and be done with it. Next, we have pillar candles. So this one's been burned a little bit already with some herbs <laughs> left over in the top. I tried to grab a new one for you, but I guess I don't have any new ones right now. So pillar candles are great for big, large workings that you want to have this burn and do energy work with over the course of, like I said, days, weeks, months. This candle is going to take a long time to burn. I want to take a moment to talk about snuffing your candle versus blowing it out versus letting it burn down fully, etc. Because once you get into these really big candles, most likely you're not going to let this burn until completion, right? This is going to take forever to burn down. And depending on what the material of the candle is, it's going to take even longer sometimes. Some people believe that you should never blow out a candle, that you should always snuff it out. So let's say you're doing a spell and you're using a big candle like this. You're lighting it up and you're letting it burn for about an hour a day. And then you want to burn it for the next day for an hour and the next day and the next day until the candle eventually burns down to nothing. Some people say you should never blow it out because you're blowing away your intention, you're blowing away the magic, etc. This, I feel like, is a total personal preference. Some people recommend getting a candle snuffer. So if this is something that's of a concern for you, get yourself a little candle snuffer, and then what you do is you light up your pillar candle, you do your energy work, you let it burn for about an hour, and then you snuff out the flame, and then the next day you light it up again, etc., etc., and you keep continuing on. I have mixed feelings about this. First of all, I don't think I've ever had a candle magic working not work because I blew the candle out instead of snuffing it. So that for me is kind of like sometimes I snuff it out, sometimes I blow it out, sometimes I scream it out. If I'm doing a baneful working and I want a lot of like aggressive energy in that working, I will scream at my candle until it blows out. <laughs> so, you know, get creative with how you want to blow out your candles. But yeah, I think it's a personal preference whether you like to snuff out your candles or blow out your candles, but I did want to at least mention Mention that in this video. So I have one of these pillar candles for self-love. It's in the other room right now and it is something that has lasted me like three months now. It has lasted a really, really long time. And what's great is that you can carve so much stuff into these candles. A bunch of different intention phrases, some sigils, you can adorn it with herbs, etc. And then you can just have this as a more permanent piece to your magical practice and just burn this candle whenever you want to work on self-love or whenever you want to work on passion or maybe you build a really big protection candle. This would be an excellent candle to use for a protection magic working because because protection is something that you always want, right? It's not a quick spell. You don't want it to pitter out really fast. You want to be protected for a really long time. So building a protection candle like this where you can light it in those moments where you want extra protection is a really great idea, especially because the work is already done. You already have your sigil and your herbs all up on here. All you have to do is light your candle for that day. So it is very low effort. I feel like it's more energy to start up a pillar candle, but less less energy to maintain it over time. And then we have taper candles. So these candles are really long and slim. These are, again, candles that you can carve an intention phrase or an intention word into. These ones are a little bit too slim to carve sigils into though. I don't use these very often for actual candle magic because the surface area is just not good for carving stuff in. That's just a me thing. But what I do like to use these taper candles for is for my altar or when I'm working with spirits, deities, you know, spirit guides, whoever it is that you're working with. These candles are great to put on altars or to create some sort of ambiance in the space that you're in. When I talk about the chessboard later in this video, when we start to dip into a little bit of intermediate advanced concepts, I'm going to talk about the chessboard. And when I talk about that, I'll come back to taper candles and what I really like to use them for. But I did want to at least mention these. These are great altar candles and great for just creating some sort of ambiance. Now let's move on to fancier candles. So the next candle I want to talk about is a bees wax candle. It's actually a pretty big one. I do have shorter beeswax candles, but what's really cool about beeswax candles is that you can unroll them. So you can unroll them all the way and then you can put all of your oils and all of your herbs inside the beeswax candle and it's sticky. So you literally just roll it back up and snap it together and then boom, 
it's a candle again. Beeswax candles are one of my favorites because they burn so clean, so, so clean. I am in love with beeswax candles. They're just a little bit more pricey though, so that's kind of like the unfortunate part. They're way pricier than, say, a little chime candle, but for a candle like this, I feel like this is where I can start dipping into more medium large spells, and I really like the ability to be able to put my herbs and oils on the inside of this candle. Let's talk about seven day candles. I have so many seven day candles here. So seven day candles, they look like this. It's basically a big pillar candle inside of a glass casing. You often see these in different religious traditions. You know, if you have some sort of saint printed on the front of it, these are typically used to venerate someone. It's meant for your prayers, your meditations of a specific religious tradition, etc. And they're known as seven day candles because these candles are meant to burn over a seven day period. But you don't necessarily have to use these seven day candles just for veneration or whatever other religious tradition you are part of, you can use them in candle magic routines. So I'll show you a couple ways that you can do this. The first way is very easy. You can create a sigil and put it on the front of your seven day candle like this. This is one of my lucky candles. I did this for good luck for myself. So every time I want a little sprinkling of good luck, I just light this up and let it burn for about, I don't know, 30 minutes to an hour or something like that. And every single time I have done this, this is my most successful luck spell I've ever done. Every single time I do this, something lucky happens within the next 24 hours. So it's really kind of exciting. I definitely recommend you creating some sort of lucky candle for yourself because who doesn't need little sprinkles of luck in their day? So you can write a sigil on the outside. Again, we'll talk about sigils and oils and all that stuff later in this video. So if you don't even know what a sigil is, I got you. We're gonna talk about that later. Another way that you can work with these is you can drill little holes into the candle. So drill little holes and then drizzle an oil into the holes or sprinkle some herbs. You don't want to do it too much though because you obviously don't want to set your herbs on fire and then you just have a flaming baton. Don't do that. But if you drill some holes, you can anoint your oils in there. And that is another way that you can personalize these seven day candles for your candle magic ritual. So with seven day candles, there's a lot of versatility. You can even get seven day candles that are pre programmed, I guess, that already have the intentions imbued into them. So for example, this is one that I bought. It's for fast luck. And with these ones, you don't really have to do much. You don't have to anoint it with oils. You don't have to add herbs. The intention of this candle is already assigned. So with all the candles that we've talked about previously, they are fully open for an assignment where you can assign whatever intention you want onto those candles. This I would consider a locked intention. So this has been made for the very specific purpose of fast luck. And then this one, I have another one where it guards against envy and greed. So this is more of a protection candle. Um, so you can get ones like this that just already have those intentions assigned. And then all you have to do when you get the candle is just center ground, direct your energy into the candle and then light it up whenever you need that specific energy. If you are a chaos magician like me and you like getting into pop culture, there are other seven day candles you can get. For example, this is one that I have of Moira Rose. And I think I've mentioned this in another video, but Moira Rose is one of my favorite characters. She's in the TV show called Schitt's Creek and she's just hilarious. So I love working with the energy of Moira Rose. I have a Wednesday Adams candle. So you can really get creative and work with different archetypes. I think it's hilarious that it says Saint Moira, the folder of the cheese on the candle. <laughs> so I would light this candle anytime I'm wanting to bring in the energy of this particular archetype of of Moira Rose or Wednesday Adams or whatever it is. So just wanted to throw these out there. The last category in the sizes and shapes category that we're talking about here is figurine candles. And I have a lot of different types of figurine candles. I wanted to show you just a couple and talk about the different things that you can do with them. So for example, this is a marriage candle. This is traditionally where you have two partners standing side by side and you can do some sort of love working around this. The, the purpose of 
a marriage candle is to bring two people together. So in fact, I'm going to be using a marriage candle similar to this in the binding ceremony that I do with my husband. We had a public ceremony for all the, the normies, you know, the normal people. And then we're gonna have a private binding ceremony with just my partner and I, and I'll be using one of the marriage candles in order to do that. So really, really great in love workings to bring two people together. There are also individual bodies that you can buy. That sounds so weird, but for example, here is an individual body. You have the woman silhouette here. And this figurine is great if you want the candle to represent a specific person that you were doing this candle ritual for, whether it's yourself, a family member, someone else, etc. What you would end up doing is carving their name and their date of birth and some other tag locks. Again, we'll talk about tag locks later in this video onto this candle. And this candle now represents that person. So you can get a male physique, you can get a female physique, whatever you want, but it just helps to identify that this is the subject of your spell. This is who the candle magic working is about. Because previously we've talked about candles where you're writing in love or protection or money or luck or whatever. This is where we start getting into spells that center around a specific person rather than an idea for the intention. If you wanna get fancy, you wanna start working with animal spirits a little bit more. I have this raven skull. So if I'm wanting to work with the archetype of the raven for uh, the particular candle magic ritual that I'm doing, you can use something like this. I also have a lion candle back there that I should have grabbed, but if you like working with animals or the different types of energies that animals can represent, you can bring that symbolism into your candle magic ritual, such as the raven skull, the lion for courage, etc. And then of course there are even more beautiful candles. This video is not sponsored or anything, but this is one of the candles that I got from um, Fifth Coven Candle Company, and they have a bunch of gorgeous candles like this. So for this figure, figurine candle. You have two hands holding a crystal ball and it's the color purple, which purple, as I discussed earlier, is the color of divination and psychic abilities and spirituality and the higher mind and things like that. So for this particular candle, given the color and the context of two witchy hands holding a crystal ball, I would use this candle for divination or increasing my psychic abilities or enhancing my relationship with my spirituality, you know, something along those lines. Lines. So again, the figurine part of it just adds additional correspondence to whatever your intention is for the spell. And the last figurine candle that I want to show here is a skull. I have a bunch of different skull candles. Let's see, the wick is kind of... There we go. I love using skulls when it comes to mind work, like psychological work. So if you're wanting to kick a bad habit, if you're wanting to rewire your brain, or maybe you wanna do a spell to get into someone else's mind, anything that has to do with the mind and the mental space, I'm gonna be using a skull for. You can also use skulls for ancestral work. A human skull can tie you to your lineage and your culture. Um, I did do a video a long time ago. I'm gonna link this one as well. I'm just gonna be linking a ton of videos, you guys. I did a video on skulls, keys, and mirrors in witchcraft. So I will link that video down below in the description box if you want to hear a little bit more about skulls and what I use them for in my craft. But skull candles in particular, any sort of mind spell, you can carve your intention into the skull and let it burn. This is a huge candle and it's gonna take a long time to burn. So I would definitely use this for a working where I wanna continue doing it for days, weeks, months, etc. So now that we've talked about the many different sizes and the shapes of candles and how to kind of pick out which candle is gonna be best for your particular ritual, I wanna talk about color now and color correspondences. I'm not gonna be giving you a color chart and there's a reason for this, so let me explain. Oftentimes when you read witchcraft books or new age spirituality books or whatever, you will see a color chart where it shows uh, specific colors that correspond to specific intentions. And sometimes you will find that a chart from one book will differ greatly from a chart in another book. It seems that no one can really agree what colors match up with what intentions. And I have come to identify that there are 
three things, three things that really play into what makes a color assigned to a particular intention. So the first one is going to be cultural context. How cultures view a specific color in one culture may be very different than what someone else views in a different culture. So for example, in the United States, when we see green, a lot of people relate the color green to money and finances because the color of our currency is green. But if you go to other countries in the world, their currency may not be green, it may be something else. And when they see orange or gold, that is what they associate to money and finances. So it really depends on the culture that you were raised in, how you perceive color. Red symbolizes a lot of different things in a lot of different cultures. So there is cultural context that you want to take in consideration. You also want to take in personal context, your personal experiences with different colors. So if you have memories attached to specific colors, you're really going to want to think of, do I want those memories in this working? Let's say you are doing a happiness ritual and you typically would bring in the color yellow for happiness, right? I think most people would relate yellow to a very to being a very happy color but if you had a bully in your life that always wore let's say a yellow raincoat and you started to associate the color yellow with this bully, someone who is really mean to you, that color yellow is not going to spark joy for you. It's not going to make you happy in this candle magic ritual. So personal context absolutely matters and you have to consider your memories with these colors and how they personally make you feel. And then the third reason is the biopsychology of color. I did do a video on this. I will definitely link it as well, but the biopsychology of color is really interesting because it's this idea that specific colors have a biological and psychological effect on us no matter what the personal context is no matter what the cultural context is so for example there have been studies on the color red and the color pink where red will increase the heart rate and pink will decrease the heart rate blue is supposedly really good for the intellect and the mind increasing mental focus or giving you some mental clarity shades also matter as well so it's not just colors it's also the shades so because this conversation is so complex complex. I'm just going to link my color magic video in the description box. And if you really want to deep dive into the biopsychology of color, feel free to watch that video. And I go over, I think every color in the rainbow and I talk about different shades and how they affect us and all of that stuff. So just wanted to put a note in this video that color definitely matters in your rituals, but there's so many different ways that we can view color. So now that we've talked about what candle magic is, you have prepared your space, you have prepared yourself, you have picked the perfect candle, you have considered color correspondences. Now it's time to pick the rest of your correspondences to go into your candle magic working. If you are brand new to this kind of stuff and you have no idea what a correspondence is, what that even means, it's basically an ingredient that you're using in your candle magic ritual that corresponds to the intention, whatever the whole purpose of your ritual is. So let's say you're doing a basic love working. You want to work on self-love or increasing the love or romance in your relationship, whatever it is. Rose petals could be considered a correspondence for a candle magic ritual like that because rose petals, the spirit of that plant or the essence of that plant, typically people relate that to love and beauty and relationships and things like that. So for a love working, rose petals is one of those basic things that pretty much anybody would recommend. So you're going to want to think about your intention of the spell and think about all the different things that correspond to that. All the different oils, plants, trees, crystals, all the different ingredients that you can be putting into this ritual that help enhance and really create this environment that screams whatever your intention is. If you are unfamiliar what corresponds to what, I definitely recommend getting a book like this. This is Llewellyn's complete book of correspondences and it's a big book. Correspondences really are so personal to the practitioner because the way that I work with Rosemary or view Rosemary may be very different than the way somebody else works with Rosemary. So yes, we can all as a community have some sort of verified personal gnosis about particular plant spirits. You also may have your own personal gnosis about how a particular plant spirit operates and what you can use it for in what types of workings. And that really just comes with time. That comes with working with different types of plants and sensing their energies and using them in various rituals to really get a feel for how you personally perceive that energy. So if you're a beginner, don't feel too overwhelmed in the fact that you may not know what goes with what yet. 
pick up a book like this and it will give you tons of correspondences for pretty much anything that you can think of. You can look up different intentions. There's a whole section on the mineral kingdom in here. You can even look up some astrological correspondences, things that correspond to specific gods or goddesses. You can literally look things up by issues, intentions, and powers. So for example, if you are doing a sleep spell, you're going to do a candle ritual for sleep to help enhance your sleep or sleep better at night or something. You would look up your intention for sleep and then there is this entire chart here that shows you all the different correspondences that go with this intention. So you've got elements, colors, the season, numbers if you want to incorporate some numerology, trees, herbs, gemstones and minerals, goddesses, gods, animals, etc. So many different types of correspondences. So pick some herbs that you want to work with, some crystals you want to work with or whatever else. Maybe there's a deity that you want to bring into your ritual, which we'll talk about later in this video too. I love, when it comes to candle magic, I really love working with powders and oils because you can anoint the area especially on a pillar candle where you have all this surface area, you can anoint this with different oils that pertain to your intention. So I did a video, I've done two videos. Here we go again. I'm gonna link more videos for you guys. I wanna give you so many resources in this video. So the first video that I'm gonna link is where I talked about magical oils. I talked about a bunch of different ways that you can use magical oils, lots of ideas for inspiration for making your own oils, etc. And then I also did another video about incense and powders, how to make your own incense and make your own magical powders. For example, I have a money powder that I made with uh, very specific plants that correspond to money and finances. And so I have that money powder already ground up and made. All I have to do is grab my money powder, a green candle or orange candle or gold candle, whatever I wanna use to represent money and finances, and then anoint the outside of the candle with that powder. And when you're applying powder to a candle, there's two different ways that you can do this, because obviously if you take powder and try to press it onto a candle like this, it's just gonna fall right off, right? So there's two methods that you can use here. You can take a lighter and you can slowly burn part of the candle so it melts a little bit, and then you can press the powder into the side of the candle and then you just kind of work your way all the way around and then eventually you have your whole powder on the outside of the candle. The second method is you can mix your powder with just a little bit of oil, whatever oil works for you. Sometimes I'll just use a basic olive oil or I'll use a magical oil that was imbued with a specific intention. And so you mix the powder and the oil together until it becomes a little bit like a paste and then you can rub that paste into the candle. And especially if you have your candle carved, if you've carved a sigil or an intention phrase into your candle, that paste gets stuck in the spots where you carved it. And so it's a really great way to outline the sigil or whatever intention phrase it is that you're carving. So powders and oils for me is where it's at. Again, feel free to check out those two videos I did on oils and powders. Think about your crystals. Are there any additional crystals that you wanna bring into your ritual space and surround your candle with? Clear quartz is an excellent crystal for people to start with. It's kind of like a catch-all crystal. It really just amplifies all of the energies in the working that are already present. Present. So I love clear quartz because it's programmable. You can have it amplify everything else that you've got going on. Or if you want to do your research on different crystals and bring in specific elements, that's totally up to you. Beyond that, think about additional symbolism that you can bring into your space. So some people like to bring in like a key and a lock and you can work with the themes of using the key to unlock the lock and having the lock be open in your ritual as a way to symbolize unlocking new possibilities opening new doors and kind of expanding things. I also discussed this a lot in that skulls, keys, and mirrors video that I already talked about previously, but I love using keys in rituals. So oftentimes with my candle magic routines, I'll have a candle, I'll have some herbs, you know, some powder and oil anointed around the candle. I'll have some crystals in the area, and then I'll also have a key to unlock certain parts of my brain or unlocking certain possibilities or whatever it is. A key carries a lot of symbolism. So so thinking about additional things that correspond to your intention, you can also bring in poppets. So this is my poppet. She represents me in a candle magic working or really any working that I'm doing. I do have a video on poppets as well. Bring in a poppet to represent some sort of focal point, to represent 
whoever the subject is. So let's say you have a candle and you don't necessarily want the candle to represent the person, you want the candle to represent the idea, the intention of love, money, luck, protection, etc. But you also want something in the ritual space that represents the person that you're wanting to direct this energy towards. So you can have a poppet that either represents yourself or maybe if you have a different subject, if it's a family member, a friend, you know, whoever it is. But bringing in poppets into the space are really complementary when you have candles that are assigned to ideas and energies, but you still want a subject present. And then of course you're going to want to consider the candle holder, depending on what type of candle you have. If you're using a votive candle, you're going to want a little candle holder. Some people just grab any old candle holder. Some people are really particular about their candle holders. It's totally up to you. Everything that you bring into your spiritual space for this candle magic ritual can have significance if you want it to. Even the candle holder. I have certain candle holders that I only use for protection workings or certain candle holders I only use in baneful magic. So it's really just up to you whatever you want to do for that. And then altar cloths. Altar cloths are another way to really set the stage and add some additional correspondence to your candle magic ritual. I have so many different altar cloths for different intentions. So for example, here is my altar cloth that I use for prosperity, abundance, opening new possibilities, etc. because it's got that beautiful gold color. It's got a little bit of a shimmer to it and it really makes me feel rich and luxurious and wealthy when I use this altar cloth. So to kind of set the stage, I'm putting putting down this altar cloth that is this gold color exuding wealth and then maybe I'm getting a green or an orange candle for money or finances or something and then I'm adding my herbal allies I'm adding crystals that correspond to wealth and prosperity and then there you have it that's a very basic prosperity ritual and for example another altar cloth that I have I have so many different altar cloths, you guys. This is one that I use for planetary magic. So this is an altar cloth that has all the signs on it. So if I'm wanting to take advantage of some sort of astrological, like if I'm doing a planetary magic ritual or something, and I really wanna take advantage of a particular zodiac sign, I can place the candle on the zodiac sign or the energy that I'm trying to bring into my ritual. So for example, if I am Again, taking the example of the sun is currently in Scorpio at the time of filming this, I would find Scorpio on my mat, if that's an energy that I wanna work with in my ritual, and place the candle on Scorpio to really just kind of double down on that energy. Again, it's all about correspondence, right? So feel free to get a variety of different altar cloths for different intentions. That's where you really can get playful and creative and dip more into that intermediate category. So you fully set the stage at this point. You have picked the perfect candle, you have all all of your correspondence is ready to go, your space is cleansed, and you are prepared. This video would not be complete if I didn't at least briefly mention how to write your intentions and also how to make sigils, of course. So let's start with intentions. When you are sitting down to write an intention, you want to write it as if it is something that you already have. So let's say you're doing a candle magic spell for home protection. Instead of writing something along the lines of, I want my house to be protected, you would change the wording and you would write, my house is protected. You're writing those intention statements as if it it's something that you already have. This is just basic spellcasting 101 type stuff, of course. So most people watching this video are already gonna have knowledge of this, but I just wanted to briefly touch on it. Magic also takes the path of least resistance. So you really wanna be careful with your wording. For example, let's say you're doing a spell because you want to lose 10 pounds or something. Just using this as an example. Because magic takes the path of least resistance, you may find that your spell manifests in a way that you did not want it to manifest. So if you wanna lose 10 pounds, Pounds, the universe may give you the flu and then you're throwing up for a week and then at the end of the week sure you've lost 10 pounds is it a healthy 10 pounds no was it a pleasant experience absolutely not so you have to be really careful with your wording because it's not just about you losing 10 pounds it's about how you're losing that 10 pounds so if I'm writing some sort of fitness goals for myself I always try to include the word healthy in the statement or in the intention statement so say I do want to lose five 10 pounds or something, I would say something along the lines of, I have healthily lost 10 pounds 
within whatever sort of time frame it is that you're looking for. Or maybe you don't want to focus on the losing weight aspect and you really just want to be a healthy 160 pounds, let's say. You could say something along the lines of, I weigh a healthy 160 pounds because we want to focus on the healthy part, right? Not the unhealthy part. I think it's also really helpful to add some sort of time frame into this. So yeah, sure, you could say, I want a Ferrari or whatever if you want a really nice fancy car. But if you don't attach any sort of time statement to it within three months or within six months, within a year, etc., the universe may not give that to you until 10 years into the future. If you're okay with that, then that's fine. But I encourage you to add some sort of timestamp to your intention statements and be realistic about it too. The bigger the spell, the more pieces have to fall into place and generally the longer it's going to take because there's so many different pieces that have to shift in order to get what you desire. So if it is something really big, you're doing this candle magic ritual for something huge and life-changing, it is going to take a little bit of time. So you're going to have to be realistic about that versus a quick birthday candle spell to find my lost ring. You know, that's something that I can have a 24 hour turnaround time with. So you've hopefully got your intention statement of what it is that you're hoping to achieve or what you desire out of this candle magic ritual. And you can potentially write it on a piece of paper and slide that underneath the candle. And as the candle burns down towards your intention paper, so are your manifestations being released out into the universe. You can write your intention on that piece of paper and then when the candle gets down to maybe here or so, you can take that piece of paper out and burn it with the candle. Or you can take your intention phrase and really boil it down to one word or just a few words and carve it into your candle. And this is kind of where we get into sigils as well. So if you're not familiar with what sigils are, sigils are symbols used for a magical purpose. So you take an intention phrase and you end up converting that intention phrase into an image which you then implant into your subconscious mind so that way the sigil can manifest subconsciously throughout your day without you even consciously thinking about it. I will also link my sigil video in the description box. There's a whole process to creating sigils, charging sigils, and activating sigils. So again, if you're not familiar with that concept, that is way too long to explore in this video. But you can create a sigil with your intention phrase and carve it into the candle. And now we're finally ready to prepare the candle to really get the ritual going. I know that we are very, very far along in this video, but really none of this should take too long. Once you already have this knowledge in the back of your mind, you're gonna be able to make all these decisions very quickly. You're going to be able to quickly decide what candle you want, what herbs you want and crystals, throw a candle magic spell together fairly fast and efficiently. I promise it shouldn't take this long in real life. Now let's finally talk about preparing the candle. So you have chosen your correspondences, you've set up your whole space, you've cleansed everything because yes, you do wanna cleanse everything, including the candle that you're working with, especially if you just bought it from a store. I mean, think about how many fingers have been on this candle touching it, people imbuing their energy into this candle without even realizing it. It went from the manufacturer, maybe into a box, then it was shipped from the mailman and then it got to you. So just to kind of start with a blank slate, it's always good to cleanse all of your materials before any sort of ritual. You're going to carve in your intentions or your sigils. You can also carve in your tag locks. So tag locks is something I wanted to talk about here. Tag locks are items that bind the spell or the working to the subject. So for example, if I'm doing a candle spell on myself, a tag lock can be hair, spit, nails, blood, any sort of DNA. It can also be that person's full name. It can be that person's date of birth. It can be a picture of that person. Anything that's going to tie the working of what you're doing to the person, to the subject of this whole ritual. So you're gonna carve into the candle whatever you want. You can do a full name. You can do a date of birth. You can do your intention phrase. You can add a sigil if you want, or if you wanna do a sigil and then print out a picture of the subject. So maybe it's your family, friend, sibling, whoever. Take a picture of them, write their full name on it in their date of birth and then put that underneath the candle and then you can carve your intention phrase onto the candle itself and let the candle burn fully down and then once the candle gets to the very bottom here take the picture out burn it to really finish everything off and then you're good to go. So let's talk about anointing the candle a little bit more because I have previously talked about powders and oils in this video and when it comes to anointing the candle, people have a lot of opinions about this. Some people say that when you anoint a candle, I'm actually gonna use a taper to demonstrate this. Some people say that if you wanna bring in energy towards you, you would anoint from the top 
to the bottom. Essentially the bottom represents you and this represents the universe. So you would be bringing it down towards you if you wanna bring something to you and vice versa. If you wanna push something away from you and get rid of something, you would anoint from the bottom to the top, pushing it away. From you. Some people have opinions that it's the exact opposite and some people say that this is towards and this is away. So at the end of the day, I don't personally think it matters that much. What matters is your own system and you being consistent with what you personally believe. Whether you think this is towards or away doesn't necessarily matter, but you need to figure out what makes sense in your own mind and then be consistent with that across all of your candle magic rituals. Another way that you can anoint this candle is if you you want to create separation. Here's another little intermediate tip for you. But if you have some oils and you want to anoint your candle with a specific oil and you want to create friction or separation, you would take your candle like this and you would twist in opposite directions, moving outwards towards the ends of the candles. And then you have the whole candle anointed with your oil. But think about breaking something apart and creating friction. You're starting in the middle and you're breaking it apart. You're creating that friction as you anoint this candle with your intention. So this is where we get into charging the candle with whatever your intention is for the ritual, because you're not just preparing the candle by slapping some herbs on it, you know, drizzling an oil, putting a crystal next to it. You are taking the time to charge this candle with your intention as you prepare it and get it ready for the actual ritual. So again, if you want to cause friction, you want to break something apart, the way that you anoint a candle can be really helpful in charging this candle with whatever it is that you're hoping to do. Maybe you also want to add a salt circle around your candle to protect your working. Salt is excellent for protection. You know, there's so many different ways that you can prepare your candle and get it ready for ritual. And again, it's all about layering those correspondences, layering on different correspondences to create the exact energy that it is that you're going for. I will put a little note here. I do see a lot of people just trying to throw in as many correspondences as they possibly can. They've got like 50,000 different things going on in a ritual. I really try to limit my correspondences down to maybe five to seven elements at the max. You know, three is really nice five is great, seven is, ooh, it's getting to be a little bit too much. Because think about if you have so many different things in your candle magic ritual, you have so many different types of energy going all different ways. It can be really chaotic and hard to control. So if you can really hone in and pick the top five to seven correspondences for your candle magic ritual, you can really hone in the energy a lot more. Sometimes less is more. You do not have to have 10 to 20 to 30 different correspondences in a ritual, unless you really want to. Unless you want to, there are some more advanced techniques. Again, when I talk about the chessboard later in this video, that does require a lot more correspondences, but that is a technique for more advanced practitioners who are used to handling different types of energy and directing things where they need to go. For a beginner, I think it's best to just work with your top three correspondences or your top five to seven. Try not to make it too overwhelming so that the energy of the spell isn't chaotic and you can streamline it towards exactly what you want. So now you're ready to light the candle and actually begin the ritual. This is where your knowledge of centering your energy, grounding your energy, and directing your energy is so important. Again, not gonna go over that in this video. You can check out that uh, other video if you really want to. But you've done all the work. You've picked out all the correspondences. You've set the stage. You've charged the candle. You've done all the things. Now, the only thing that you need to do is to focus on your energy work, to direct your intention and your energy from your body, down your arms, and into the candle working, and really spend time visualizing what it is that you want. And as I mentioned in the beginning of this video, you're gonna visualize it as if it's something that you already have. So you wanna focus on what that's gonna look like, what it feels like, what other sensory things can you come up with. This is also where you would chant your incantation. If you are someone that likes chanting incantations, some people prefer reading from a book and citing their incantations that way. I personally, if I'm gonna do an incantation, in most most of my candle magic rituals, I don't do any incantations. The only 
everything that I do is visualization from my own mind of seeing what it is that I want. But if I do an incantation, it's something that I've memorized beforehand because for me, there's nothing worse than preparing a whole candle magic ritual and then having to read from a book and taking my focus completely away from what it is that I'm actually doing in order to read something. And I know other people feel very differently and some people love reading from a book. For me, it takes me completely out of my element and I have to focus on reading the words and I don't feel connected to the words at all. So if you are gonna say an incantation, I highly recommend memorizing it beforehand. That way you can really be in the moment, you can feel the emotions, you can raise the energy, and you're saying this chant over and over without a second thought because it's already in your head, you've already got it memorized. If memorization is not your thing and reading an incantation is not your thing, you don't have to say anything at all. You do not have to chant over your candle unless you want to. Some people like to wake their working up. So if you've got everything charged and ready to go, you're sitting down in front of your candle, you're directing your energy. Some people will wake it up by clapping. They will clap over their working or rub their hands and get some friction going before they put their hands over their working just to kind of wake things up and to really raise the energy of the environment. Because it's really important that as you are directing your energy that you're also raising energy, which is what I talk about in that other video. And then there you have it. You can spend some time burning your intention papers, meditating as the candle burns down fully. There are some additional techniques that I will include in the next section, but that's basically all you need to do during this period of the ritual is just directing and raising your energy. Let's talk about some additional candle magic techniques. Again, this is kind of where we dip out of the beginner zone and we get more into the intermediate advanced zones. This is all according to my own opinion because nobody can declare what is intermediate, beginner or advanced because there's no actual set curriculum for anything like this. One of my favorite candle magic techniques is when you have two people that you either want to break apart or push together. So let's say you wanna reach out to someone or you want somebody to reach out to you. You wanna bring someone closer to you. You either want them to call you, you want them to be attracted to you, this is great for just a basic attraction spell, or the opposite, if you really want to get someone out of your life because they're driving you crazy and you just want them to go away, this is the technique that I typically use for spells like that. So you have two candles. The first candle represents you, so you're going to carve your name, your date of birth, add your tag locks, add your saliva, your hair, your nail clippings, whatever you want to this candle. The second candle is going to represent the other person. You're gonna do the same exact thing for them. If you don't have like saliva and hair and things like that, use a picture of them and you can place their picture underneath the candle as it burns. You can carve in their full name, their date of birth, whatever information you have. I already know that I'm gonna get this question in the comments. No, you do not have to know their full date of birth, their full name, etc. You do not have to have this information, but the more information you have, the better, the more precise that you can be. So no, it's not necessary to have all of that information, but more information is better. So you have two candles that represent the two people, the subjects of the spell. Let's say you wanna do an attraction spell. You wanna bring this person closer to you. On day one, you would set these candles about, what is this? This is way more than 12 inches. I don't know, however far apart you want to, and you would burn the candles for a set period of time. And maybe you would burn it only till about there or something. You would snuff the candles out. And then the next day you would move the candles slightly closer together. And you can either move both of them together or you can just be here and you can move this candle closer to you. It, whatever symbolism you wanna do is fine. And then again, you would let the candles burn just a little bit more the next day. And then the next day, you bring the candles even closer together until eventually the two candles are basically touching and then you let it burn down to completion. And this is just a very basic attraction spell to bring someone towards you. And you can do the exact same thing with getting rid of somebody, right? You can start with two candles that are close to each other. And then as the days go on and you continue to burn the candle, you can bring them further and further apart, almost to the point where you can even put this candle outside on your back door if you want to and kick them out of the house. So it's just some additional symbols symbolism, bringing people together, or kicking someone out of your life and getting rid of them. A lot of people are probably familiar with cord cuttings because it's like all over TikTok. Everyone pretty much knows what a cord cutting is. And it's basically where you take two candles. If you've got someone that you want to cut out of your life, you tie some rope or string around the two candles and then you let it burn down. Some people like to just let it burn down fully and burn the cords. Some people like to actually take some ritual scissors and cut the cord between the two candles as they're burning. 
So you can definitely Google some cord cuttings specifically if that's something that you're interested in. Another technique that I like to use is mala beads. So this is back from my Buddhist days. I love mala beads. A traditional mala necklace has 108 beads and the number 108 is a very, very spiritual number and it holds a lot of significance. The one is significant, the zero is significant, and so is the eight. And then all three together create this power number that is fantastic to use in rituals. If you're interested in the significance of 108, just Google it, read all about it. It's really interesting. Anyway, so I have a bunch of different malas. This one is fluorite. Um, so if I have a spell that I wanna use fluorite in, this is a way that I can bring in some crystal correspondences beyond just putting crystals around my candle. What I do is you start with the big bead or usually like right where the tassel is. And as the candle burns, let's say you have a big pillar candle that is going to take a long time to burn down. And this is a working that you wanna do over the course of a really long time. Every day that I light the candle, I would sit and chant my intention, my mantra, whatever it is that you're doing in that moment, 108 times. Yes, 108 times. This is probably one of the most effective candle magic rituals I have ever done in my life. So I definitely swear by this, but you take your mala beads and you go bead by bead, chanting your intention, your phrase, whatever it is, and you literally work through every single bead until you've returned back to the beginning. And then you can extinguish your candle and then the next day you do the same thing. So that's one of my favorite techniques. Yes, it is a lot of work, but is it effective? Absolutely, especially for big spells that need a lot of power, a lot of oomph, a lot of movement. I love using mala beads. The next technique that I wanna share with you is what I call the four pillars technique. This is something that I have developed myself. I didn't read it in any book anywhere, though I'm sure somebody else does this somewhere. So you need five candles total, and I'm not gonna actually show you because I don't wanna waste my candles, but I will explain it to you. You have one big candle in the center, like a pillar candle or something, and then you have four chime candles around it. So you have one in north, one in east, one in south, one in west. They don't actually represent the four directions, I'm just saying that so you can visually see where they go. So you have the big candle and you've got four smaller candles around it. And this four pillars technique is really, really great if you wanna tackle a big problem from a bunch of different angles. So let's say you have a really complicated situation and there's a bunch of moving pieces. You're not really sure the best way to tackle a situation. Each pillar, each chime candle that you put in the corner represents a different aspect of that problem or whatever the intention is, what you're trying to change. And the big candle represents you or represents the situation, etc. So you've got big candle in the center that represents the subject. And then you've got the four chime candles around it that represent different aspects of that that you really want to affect. So each chime candle has its own different herbal correspondences. You've got different powders, different oils on each candle because each one of these is almost like a mini spell. Again, this gets complicated because we're not in the beginner zone anymore. So what you do is you dress all four of these candles tackling different areas of the situation. And on the first day, you move your big candle to the north position, let's say it's next to the red candle, and you leave this big candle in the north position until this chime candle burns down fully. And then once it has burned down fully, the next day, you move your candle to the east position to the next issue that you wanna tackle, and you let it sit there until this chime candle burns down fully. Then the next day, you move the big candle to south, and then you are burning these two in the south, until this one burns down fully, and then you end in the west. Again, you don't have to do northeast, southwest. You can do it in any direction you want. I'm just using this as an example. But then you end on the last one, and you let this burn down fully, and then you would also let this burn down fully. So this pillar candle is actually maybe a little bit too big for what um, I'm discussing because this would typically be like a four day spell. This would take way longer than four days to burn. <laughs> so you wanna consider the size of your candle accordingly. Maybe something like this beeswax candle or this votive or something would be better for the center candle. You can figure that out yourself. But 
The four pillars technique is where you have the four different issues, the big subject in the middle, and then you're moving it through all of these issues and burning down all those issues and clearing blockages and opening up the path for what it is that you actually want. Another technique, you can call in a spirit guide, a god or a goddess, or some other being to help you with this candle magic ritual. So rather than you just putting out a ton of energy and doing this whole candle magic ritual by yourself, you can bring in additional guides into your ritual space to assist you with this working. So you can write petitions, which is basically you are petitioning either a saint or a deity or some sort of spirit guide to help you with this. Some petitions are a little bit more transactional, especially I've heard with saints. I don't personally work with saints, but if you do, I have heard from my friends that work with saints that it's very much a transactional experience. They write down what they want out of the candle magic working, and then they give something in exchange. So it's basically worded like, if you give me this, I will give you this. And it's a very transactional relationship. Whereas with a god or a goddess, you're really petitioning them for their assistance in exchange for maybe veneration. You are worshiping them and working with them. I mean, when it comes to spirit allies, again, that's a topic that deserves its own separate video because you really wanna have a good standing relationship with this spirit guide before you even call upon them, right? It would be kind of rude to ask someone to help you move whom you've never spoken to before and you have zero relationship with. They're probably going to say, absolutely not. I'm not going to help you move. Why are you asking me? I don't even know you. But just to throw that out there in a video like this, as you can ask additional entities to help you with your candle magic working. You can also use the fire from your candle magic workings to feed other workings. So for example, I have a money bowl. A money bowl brings in prosperity, good fortune, abundance. It literally brings in money into my house. I will also link my money bowl video. There's going to be so many videos linked in the description box for this video. At least you can say I gave you resources. Anyways, so I have this money bowl and it's something that you want to actively feed. You want to continuously push your energy into it and keep it alive. You don't want the energy around a money bowl to get stagnant. You can use your candle magic workings to feed the money bowl. So you can create a candle for money and good fortune and finances and all that. Dress it accordingly, carve on it, etc., and have that sitting next to your money bowl to kind of double down on that and really boost the working of your money bowl. So feel free to get creative and use your candles to boost other workings. You don't have to just do a candle magic working. You can layer your workings on top of each other to get even more complicated and produce potentially even greater results. And then of course there are many, many other candle magic rituals that you can do, such as taking a single candle and dedicating it to your god or your goddess or a spirit guide, etc., and then using that candle in spirit communication. So it wouldn't necessarily be in a candle magic spell. You're not necessarily trying to get something in the mundane world. It's more for communication. And I think I am going to make a video about working with spirits in general and talk about using candles as a way to communicate with them because like most things that deserves its entire own <laughs> section because when we talk about spirits, things can get really complicated really fast. You can also scry with candles, not even just working with spirits, but scrying in general. You can scry into the flame of the candle. You can let a candle burn down completely and then scry the candle wax. So divination with candles is its whole separate thing. I did do a video though on scrying candle wax in water. So I will include that video if you're really interested in working with the candle wax as a way to receive prophetic messages. And lastly, in this category, I really want to talk about mixing and matching different different candles of different colors, shapes, sizes, etc. For example, I love using a white candle and a black candle together to represent duality and to tackle a situation from two very different angles. So you can use your color correspondences in this way and really mix and match your candles to fit the whole scene of what it is that you're trying to achieve. Use different shapes and different numbers so you can bring in some numerology with the number of candles that you have in your candle magic ritual whether you have three candles for creation, maybe you have five candles for change, 10 candles for completion, every number one through 10 has its own spiritual significance. So I encourage you to look into numerology a little bit and bring in some of those elements, the numbers of candles, the number of crystals surrounding each candle, the number of times that you carve something into a candle can have significance as well. If this is a candle for protection and security, you can carve your intention in four 
times because four is typically the number of stability, structure, support, things like that, and bring in numerology that way. But really playing around with mixing and matching all these different correspondences, colors, shapes, sizes, numerology, all of that stuff. I really wanna encourage people to get super creative with their rituals. Now let's talk about my favorite technique, which I call the chessboard. So this is going to be really complicated for me to explain in a video because it typically requires a lot of candles and A, I don't wanna use all of my candles. That would be very silly of me to just light up and waste all of my candles for a simple demonstration. So sorry, you guys, I'm not gonna waste my candles. I will just have to verbally explain it to you and hopefully you're able to get the point. B, I don't want to show my personal workings when it comes to the chessboard for personal reasons. You know, everybody's got to keep their secrets. And C, the chessboard changes depending on the situation. I, I can't even show you how to do a chessboard because it changes on every unique situation. So let me attempt to verbally explain. I will do my best. Bear with me. A chessboard is for big spells big spells with a lot of moving pieces. I've kind of already alluded to this a little bit throughout this video that you can use many candles to symbolize many different pieces of the working. So the phrase that I like to use to think about it this way is, everyone else is playing checkers, but babe, I'm playing chess. So you would set up your whole scene with multiple different candles, arranging them in different shapes, using different colors and sizes, etc. As I mentioned in the point about mixing and matching, I call it a chess board because by the time that you set up all these different candles. There's so much going on and you are instructing your pawns where to go. So let's say you have nine candles and you arrange them in a V shape and then you advance your V shape towards the goal. Let's say you have the goal on the right side and the V shape of the nine candles on the left. The nine represents something very specific. The shapes of the candles, the colors of the candles represent something specific. Every single candle on the chessboard is anointed with oils and powders that are specific to whatever that candle is representing, whatever subject that candle represents on the chessboard. And then you are arranging the candles in different shapes to also represent the situation. So whether you arrange your candles in a circle, whether you arrange it in a square, squares for me typically relate to structure and support, it's very grounding energy, or if you arrange the candles in a pyramid or a more V shape, which for me relates to power and really channeling that power to a specific goal. You can arrange your candles in a diamond shape. So every shape is going to have additional symbolism depending on your culture. Like circles, for example, can represent a cycle complete, some sort of completeness or infinity. So consider the symbolism of different shapes for you in particular, how you personally relate to different shapes and bring those shapes into your spell work, onto your chessboard of all these different candles. So again, taking that example of nine different candles shaped in a V to funnel the energy of the number nine of a specific color towards the intention goal, which is on the right, and each day moving that V closer to the intention goal. Or maybe you have a lot of different people in a situation and it's really complicated because you want something to happen, but you have like five different people involved. Or maybe you have multiple different groups of people involved. You can have candles that represent all these individual people involved or all these groups involved. Add your tag locks to those candles and then arrange them accordingly on your chess piece. And over the next coming days or weeks, as you are burning down these candles, you are moving Moving these candles across the chessboard to where you want them to go. So it's a lot of movement, it's a lot of shapes, it's a lot of numerology, it's just a lot going on. <laughs> and again, I can't really show you what this looks like because as I previously mentioned, I don't want to share my own personal workings because that's way too invasive. And the chessboard is going to look differently depending on your unique situation. So you are going to have to get really creative and look at your situation, look at all angles of it, everything that's interfering with it and make a candle for each one of those things. And then look at the symbolism of other elements and put that all together into your own chessboard. Think of mastermind energy. Nobody should even tell you how to to be your own mastermind in the first place. This is definitely something you'll have to figure out for yourself.
I would like to conclude this video with a list of some very basic candle magic tips that didn't quite fit into any of the other categories, but I still wanted to put them in this video. So with candle magic, I think it's important to note that we are working primarily with the fire element. Yes, you can bring in some additional correspondences for water, earth, and air, but really with candle magic, fire is at the center of this ritual. And I think it's important to contemplate the significance of that. So with earth, for example, earth is a very slow and steady energy. When we're using earth energy in our spells, it adds this wonderfully grounding nature to it, and it ultimately gives you really slow and steady results, at least in my experience. You may not receive things quickly if you're doing a spell with a lot of earth correspondences in it because of the nature of that element, versus fire, fire is very different. It's very quick, but it also burns out very quickly. So the fire element can really bring results to you very fast, but sometimes it's very unstable. So for quick magic, fire is an excellent element to use. But if you're wanting something more long lasting and long term, and you're using a candle, you're using the fire element in order to achieve this, you might want to bring in some additional correspondences that really ground that energy as well. So going back to our example of self-love. This is something that you want to bring into your life and that you want to keep in your life long term. You don't want it to burn out quickly. Yes, the fire element can help bring it to you very quick, but you're going to want something to also ground that energy and make it stay in your life a lot longer. Build a good foundation. So I would bring in a lot more earth elements. I would bring in crystals. You can even use dirt in your rituals. Literally use dirt magic. I love dirt in spells. But just thinking about other elements that you can incorporate to really well balance your spell. So I just wanted to point that out that though the fire element is great for quick results, those results aren't always sustainable and you might want to consider supplementing other things into your candle magic rituals to really balance out the results. Another thing I wanted to mention here is that even after doing your candle magic ritual, you still need to take action in the mundane world. You still need to be working towards your goal. You don't want to give the universe any friction in giving you what you desire. So going back to our example of, you know, losing 10 pounds or being a healthy 160 pounds or whatever it is, if you do a candle magic spell to be really fit and really healthy, but then you sit on your couch and you eat french fries and fast food all day and cookies and chips and all of those things, it's going to be really, really hard for the universe to manifest that to you because you are not in alignment with your intention. You are causing so much friction by doing a candle magic working for one thing and then performing actions in your mundane life that directly oppose what your spell was about. So if you're casting a spell to be healthy and fit, you gotta walk the talk. You've gotta do the same exact thing in your mundane life. You can't just expect the world to hand you things on a silver platter while you do the complete opposite of what it is that you said that you wanted. Another tip, have patience and trust the universe. This is one of the hardest parts. Once you've gone through all the work of doing a candle magic ritual, it is so hard to just have patience and wait for it to come to you. I encourage you to trust that it's coming and try to put it out of sight, out of mind. Try not to obsess on it too much. I know this is an extremely difficult thing for a lot of people. Once you cast a spell or do a candle magic working, everyone's like, is it done yet? Am I getting it? When's it coming? When's it gonna be here? But I encourage you not to lust for results and to really try to put it out of your mind as best as possible. Distract yourself if you need to, okay? <laughs> Feel free to do a whole distraction method. I also think it's important to keep a record of what it is that you did in your ritual, and this is for a couple reasons. It's so important to keep a record. For one, if you ever need to reverse this candle working, you're gonna need your notes. You're gonna need to know exactly what you did in this spell so you can do everything in reverse and so you can undo what you did. So keep a record just to cover your bases if you ever need to reverse this spell at any point. And you also wanna keep a record for yourself to get better and more efficient over time because when this spell manifests, because it will, say to yourself that it will manifest, when it does manifest for you, you wanna ask yourself, how did this spell manifest and how closely was it to what I actually wanted. And that is where you can go back into your notes and see what you did and see what you can do better next time. Because maybe your spell didn't really manifest in the way that you wanted it to. You got what you wanted ultimately, but it just wasn't in the way that you were hoping. That is where you go back to your notes, you see what you did, see if you can become a little bit more precise next time. And it's also good to see how long it takes for things to manifest as well. If you're doing a 
quick, short spell. I know from my own personal notes that I can have a very quick, small spell manifest within a couple of days. For a medium spell, I'm probably looking at a couple weeks to a month for that to manifest. And for larger spells, sometimes it can take up to six months for all of those pieces to finally fall into place. And it's good to know that about yourself. It's good to know about how long your magic takes so that you can set proper expectations for yourself. So keep a record of everything that you did. It is going to be so helpful for the future. Ooh, that was a lot of information, wasn't it? I really hope that you enjoyed this video. I put a ton of work into this video, so much work. If if you appreciated it, if you learned something from me, feel free to leave a super thanks. There's like a thanks option down at the bottom of this video. It's kind of like a tip jar. All the funds from my YouTube channel go towards my college tuition. Consider potentially becoming a channel member. There's a bunch of perks on YouTube for channel members, such as early access videos and content polls and things like that. So I encourage you to maybe look at that, see if that's something that you're interested in, or just like, share this video, subscribe to the channel, you know, do all the things. I appreciate the support, whatever that looks like. Thank you so much for watching this video. I will see you all again soon.